Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to my channel. It's Brittany here with another video to help you guys live a happy, healthy, awesome life in a wheelchair. And today I am going to share with you guys some things that I think are the hardest uh, parts about living with a spinal cord injury. I did a video a very long time ago about the best parts of having a disability or living in a wheelchair and I wanted to sort of balance that out with some of the challenging things because I don't want to ever paint a picture that I am always perpetually positive. And to be honest, living in a wheelchair is sometimes really challenging. And just lately there have been some things piling up on me that have made it a little bit challenging to stay positive. I'm still positive. I have a positive attitude just in general, but there are definitely things that have challenged my will to stay positive lately. So I wanted to share some of the things that I think are the most common sort of mental burdens when you have a spinal cord injury and the things that sometimes make it the most challenging to stay positive or to just, you know, not be grumpy, which I know that it's, it's easier said than done, but um, I really, I don't want to be grumpy most of the time. And I, don't think most people in wheelchairs or with disabilities want to be grumpy, but sometimes it can be really hard not to be when there's a lot of these things that I'm going to talk about that are just kind of bombarding you all the time uh, and that you have to navigate on a daily basis. So I am going to start uh, with number one. So here we go. The hardest parts of living with a spinal cord injury. Number one, managing a neurogenic bladder and bowel. So if you ask anybody with a spinal cord injury, they're probably going to mention this as one of the hardest things that they have to learn to live with and one of the hardest things to learn to manage. It is a constant mental struggle to think about this stuff when you're first paralyzed. It takes so much mental energy and it's really exhausting. Not to mention, it just is one of the hardest things to accept that you have to live with, that you no longer can control your bowel and bladder in the way that you used to before, and that it's going to be something that you have to deal with for the rest of your life and potentially have accidents, all these things. Just some of the things that I think about on a daily basis. I have my snazzy book here, so I'm gonna read these out. Uh, where am I gonna pee? This one is always on my mind. Where am I gonna pee? Am I gonna pee in the car? Is there gonna be a space for me to pee? Especially if I go for like a walk or a bike ride or something, I don't know where I'm gonna pee. And sometimes I just have to pee wherever and whether it's in an awkward situation, even sometimes in a situation that, you know, is probably inappropriate for other people to see, but I have to pee when I have to pee. And if there's no place for me to get to that's appropriate, I just kind of have to make the best of the situation. And I've done that multiple times in my life, but it's still really annoying. Um, what is the bathroom gonna look like? Again, just one of those situations. Can I even get in the bathroom? How much did I drink today? Am I drinking enough to prevent a UTI? Am I drinking enough to, you know, flush my bladder? Am I drinking enough to keep my kidneys healthy? Am I drinking too much that's gonna tax my kidneys or all of these things? Am I drinking too much for this situation so that I'm gonna have to pee before there's access to a bathroom? Just always thinking about how much I'm drinking. Does my pee smell or look funny? This is an odd thing and you can put in the comments if you're one of the people that does this or maybe I'm totally alone. I've talked to my other friends about this, but I smell my pee every single time I go to the bathroom. I, if you've watched my other videos where I show how I pee, I pee into a container and so I smell it before I dump it out because I need to know if it's smelling really funky and if it looks really funky. So I'm constantly thinking, what does my pee smell like? What does my pee look like? Will I have access to doctors if I get a UTI on vacation? This is a huge one. If I go on vacation and I need medical intervention for a UTI, where am I gonna get it? Lots of the time I bring uh, antibiotics with me, but this is constantly something that I'm thinking about. And something that goes along with that is please don't get a UTI during blank, blank, blank vacation, during whatever, when I'm working, during my kids' you know recital, Whatever it is that I have coming up that is exciting, I'm like praying that I don't get a UTI and I'm overdrive, in overdrive, trying to prevent UTIs. I'm taking d manos, I'm eating garlic, I'm doing all these things so that I don't get a UTI because I really don't want it to mess anything up. Uh, some other things that I think about that are not related to my bladder, but to my bowel. Did I eat enough fiber today? Did I eat too much fiber? Is it gonna constipate me? 
Did I drink enough water so I don't get constipated? Uh, how early do I have to wake up to do my bowel routine? If I'm somewhere where there's only one bathroom, I have to make sure that I'm getting up super early so that I'm out of the bathroom before everybody else gets in there. Cause sometimes I'm in there for like half an hour, 40 minutes. And sometimes that doesn't seem like a, a long time, especially, I don't know, my husband sometimes takes half an hour in the bathroom, but I'm more worried about it in the morning because I do my bowel routine in the morning and people are showering in the morning and trying to get ready. Am I making too much noise in the morning? Am I getting up too early in the morning? Especially when I'm around like my brother who's got a one-year-old or my sister who's got a four-year-old. Am I gonna be waking the kids up by flushing the toilet and making noise in the morning if I get up too early? So should I wait to get up uh, before they're up or should I wait to get up after they're up? So it's just like a lot of mental, uh, I guess strategizing about how I'm going to manage my bladder and bowel and it gets exhausting uh, and it's really hard sometimes. You get used to it, so if you're watching this and you're newly injured, don't, I don't wanna make it sound like this is like, oh, it's never gonna get better. You do learn to manage all of these things sort of like running on autopilot, like programming in the back of your mind. It's like your computer just running programs while it's doing other things, but it definitely can get exhausting. Okay, that's number one. Number two is, not being able to mentally relax like ever. And this is related to number one. There's just so many things that you have to think about in order to keep yourself alive when you have a spinal cord injury that I don't really feel like I ever have that time to just like mentally check out. Even if I'm like sick or anything like that, I don't get to take a break from doing my bowel routine, which takes physical energy and you know making sure I drink enough and all of these things. Otherwise, I'm gonna get a UTI or I'm gonna get constipated and I'm gonna be paying for it after. So even when I'm like not feeling very well, I still have to do all of these things. And I just want to go back sometimes to a time when I was like, well, I was 13 when I was paralyzed, so like 12 years old when I could just lay on the couch for hours and watch movies and not even think about when I'm gonna go pee next or not even think about anything really, just, do my thing and, and totally relax. That hasn't happened in 24 years. So um, I do relax in short spurts, like an hour or two. I can have a nap or sit on the couch and watch a movie. But um, yeah, it's definitely not something that I get the luxury of doing for long periods of time. Okay, uh, number three, chronic pain. Chronic pain is something that um, a lot of people live with with spinal cord injuries. I'm pretty lucky in that I don't have it every single day, but I definitely get bouts of chronic pain where it's really taxing and I don't get to give my body a rest. Like I can't stop using my arms, the body parts that I can feel because I can only really feel a quarter of my body from my armpits up. And sometimes that whole quarter of my body is in pain. Uh, right now I have like a weird nerve pain thing and it's just creating tons and tons of discomfort in my upper body and in my lower body, even though it's just phantom pain, it's all just really uncomfortable right now. So uh, I'll get back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, wrist pain, and nerve pain all at different times and for different reasons. Um, and luckily, hopefully, not all at the same time. Luckily, they've never really been all at the same time, but I do get bouts of chronic pain and it can be really challenging to just go about my day when I am in pain and I can't rest the body part that's hurting. Uh, so that's number three. Number four, having compassion for people and a world that doesn't understand what I need. And I try to explain this to people in a way that makes sense, but I don't know if it actually will. So I'm gonna try and explain it. I, th I have like a compassion meter and it gets used up a lot. And I think people would assume that it's able-bodied people having compassion for people like me who have a spinal cord injury. But more often than not, I feel like I am having compassion for able-bodied people because they just don't understand what I need and half the time um, they're doing something that's making my life harder or they're taking away some of the things that are meant for me that are meant to make my life easier just because of their own ignorance. And I don't ever think people are doing this on purpose or you know, because they're trying to make my life bad or don't care about me. I just think it's like ignorance. They just don't know and they never really knew anybody that had a disability, so they just don't think about it. So some of the things that happen to me regularly are things like business owners that don't have an accessible 
um, business, they just don't care enough about people with disabilities because it's a cost to make their location accessible. And I have compassion for those people because I understand what it must be like to be an entrepreneur and how much it must cost to start a business and all of the factors that go into the decisions to make your business accessible or not accessible or how well you're doing at that. And I think that people aren't, you know, trying to be evil. They're just going, you know, with the money that I have available and the resources that I have available, you know, how much can I do and how much is it going, how much business is it going to get me? And so I understand that there's like a thought process that goes into it, but when you're the one that's affected, it still feels really shitty. So I have compassion for people like that, that, you know, are trying to do their best in the world and yet are making decisions that don't allow me access to their their business for whatever reason. Um, I have compassion for those people. I have compassion for people that park in accessible stalls and, you know, are just running in for a minute or they park there uh, for whatever reason. I try and have compassion for them and go, you know, they're not, they're not trying to be evil. Uh, I have compassion for people that go in accessible stalls when they probably shouldn't or that when they don't need them. If I, you know, see them, I try and not be mean or mad at them uh, because I know that they're probably not trying to do anything to me. But I have compassion for a lot of things during the day that just don't work for me. Um, recently, I tried to buy tickets for, to a concert for my daughter and the accessible seating was almost filled up and it was really frustrating so i have compassion for you know the the building owners and all of that stuff for you know the amount of accessible seats that they chose to have and i understand why it's hard to make more of a venue accessible like there's just so many things that i think on a daily basis i i excuse or i understand people for and it gets really exhausting it gets really frustrating at times and at times my compassion meter gets used up. So that's one of the things that I think is really challenging as a wheelchair user is just living in a world that doesn't work for you and then trying to navigate that and also not, you know, make make yourself mad every day at people that don't mean to be um, inconsiderate. They just are being inconsiderate. So that was a long-winded way of saying that one. Uh, anyway, having compassion for people and a world that doesn't uh, doesn't exactly work for you. Okay, number five, missing out on things that are not wheelchair accessible. Even if you're the most independent and active person and a really low paraplegic and you can do a lot of things, uh, there's still some things that are just absolutely not wheelchair accessible, at least not right now. And you're gonna miss out on some things and you're gonna watch other people go and do them and there's always this mix of like joy, especially if it's somebody you love that's going to do it, and sadness. So the mix of joy and sadness. You love that the person gets to do it and you're so happy for these able-bodied people that get to go and have this fun experience, but you're so sad that you can't join them. Uh, and that's just a reality. There's certain things that I'll never be able to do and I have to be okay with that. I'm. It's sad, so that's another one of the hard things. Um, number six, feeling a mix of negative emotions while trying to remain positive and not resent others or make their experience miserable. So this is one of those situations where you're with other people, uh, or maybe not with other people. This is sometimes when you're sending other people off to do things that are really fun and you're like, oh my God, I hope you have so much fun. And then you're like dying inside thinking, I wish I could go too, but also not trying to make their send off be really negative and be like, you know what, I wish I could go too and feel really bad for me while you're doing the fun thing and think about me every second and how lucky you are that you can do it and you know, don't take it for granted. Like, I'm not gonna do that to people. So sometimes this is if you're sending people off to do things that you wish you could do or sometimes this is if you're in a room full of people doing something that you wanna do. Like uh, cheerleading, for example. Uh, my friend Tash and I went to an event where we had to watch cheerleaders and um, she used to do cheerleading, so she was watching them do the thing that she really, really missed, and she can't do it anymore. And so you're sitting there with this mix of like horribly negative emotions and sadness and resentment and jealousy and like all of these things going through your head while at the same time smiling and clapping and you know, congratulating the people and be like, oh my God, your routine was so great. 
and yet you're feeling all of these like weird things inside and it's an odd sort of place to live in sometimes where you're like actually really feeling really shitty but you don't want to make other people know that and you don't want to ruin everybody else's experience in that moment so you're kind of just putting on a on a face um for everyone else and it's then it's really challenging so that's one of the hardest things um number seven is feeling like a burden when accessibility issues affect others i mentioned this before with my daughter me trying to get accessible tickets at a concert and they were almost sold out and i was really trying to get them and then a few times it said that there was no tickets left and i probably tried getting these tickets like 10 times and I was like so frustrated in this process because my daughter just wanted to go to this one concert to see this one singer that we both really like and she wanted to go with me. And there's only, you're only allowed to get two tickets in a wheelchair section. I understand why. I understand why you can only get two tickets, but it's stupid because I have more than one person that I want to go to a concert with. So not only was I trying to get concert tickets for me and my daughter and I could only get two with me and her because we were going to be the ones sitting in the wheelchair section. I was trying to coordinate getting tickets with my mom and my sister and my sister-in-law and they're not allowed to sit with me. So we're trying to coordinate the places where they can sit, where it's going to be close and not really weird for them to be super far away. Um, and accessibility issues just affect other people that you are with a lot. And I was like, oh my God, if I wasn't in a wheelchair, I could just buy regular tickets, sit with everybody. My daughter could sit with everybody. It would be super fun. And I was just so frustrated. So I was frustrated for me and I was frustrated for her that my life is now affecting her ability to go to a concert with her grandma and her auntie. And it sucks. And you don't really know what this is like until you are in this situation. If you are in a wheelchair and you're watching this, you get it, I don't have to tell you what this feels like. Um, but if you're not in a wheelchair, you just won't know unless you know somebody in a wheelchair that you love and you wanna go with them. And you can't because, you know, an accessibility issue is, is messing shit up. That happens a lot when your wheelchair or your disability makes things harder for other people. And I know that feeling like a burden is something that I feel and generally not something that other people feel but it's still really hard to grapple with and not feel like when if you weren't there, that issue wouldn't even exist. So um, that's something that comes up a lot and that I've had to deal with multiple times over the years and get used to feeling okay with. Uh, okay, number eight, not being able to get in people's houses easily. This is one that is just really annoying. Commercial construction is definitely getting better in terms of accessibility. There's laws that say that places have to be accessible to a certain degree. Uh, so most of the time the parking's accessible, you can get in the door, there's gonna be a bathroom, but there, the residential construction is just not there yet. It probably never will be because, it's, I don't know, it would probably be impossible to make everybody's house accessible, but it still poses a really big challenge when you are in a wheelchair and you meet somebody that you wanna hang out with and their house is inaccessible. Again, you have to do the thing where they're gonna have to lift you into their house or you know, whatever it is to make it work. And um, it's just really annoying. So I have lots of friends in wheelchairs because I can get in their houses. And generally, unless somebody offers to for me to come over, I won't just be like, hey, can I come to your house? Because, you know, I don't want to impose and be like, oh, and by the way, you have to lift me in there. Um, it just feels really awkward sometimes. So I feel really grateful to people that are um, sort of, open to helping me and offer to help me into their houses and things like that but not everybody feels comfortable with that so I don't want to you know force them to do it if I haven't been invited so okay uh two more number nine the length of time it takes to do things um it just takes so long when you're in a wheelchair to do everything and it's frustrating sometimes like just running errands you know one two three stops i'm okay but like four or five just getting in and out of a car takes way longer than it would normally take an able-bodied person so errands take hours longer than it would take somebody who wasn't in a wheelchair or didn't have a mobility issue and it's frustrating sometimes because i am constantly wanting to keep up with you know people that i see that are able-bodied and i just can't i cannot keep up to them in life in general and it sometimes makes me feel really shitty, 
but if I try to keep up with them, then my health declines and I don't have any energy. I'm not happy. So I have to really watch how often I try to compare myself to able-bodied people. Um, and I just have to do what I can do in the time that I can do it and not really worry about how long it's taking me. But it sometimes get really frustrating when I just want to get shit done and I can't because it's taking me a really long time. Okay, last one. Having to accept help or wait for help or accept that that help is not going to do things the way that you would do it. Uh, this one is something that's sort of like, it's like a double-edged sword. I love that people are there to help me. I really do. It's one of the things that I think is the, the best about being in a wheelchair is meeting people, having to interact with people, engaging with people, seeing the, uh, like the kindness of people. So getting help is great in that way, but it's also super frustrating. Some of the things that I need help with, I have to wait for people to help me. I have to wait days sometimes for my husband to have enough time to help me do the thing that I need help with. And a lot of the time, you don't want to be like, oh, help me do this, and then I'm going to nitpick about every little thing that you do while you're doing it, while you're helping me. I definitely do that to my husband, so I don't want to say that I don't do that because uh, I have control issues in a lot of ways, but um, you can't do that all the time, otherwise people would never help you. You have to be grateful that they're helping you and you know, sort of work with them in order to get whatever it is done that they're helping you do, but without being sort of a naggy biatch while they're doing it. So um, yeah, those are, my, those are my 10 things that are really hard about being in a wheelchair. Uh, if you have other ones that you think I missed, put them in the comments below. Uh, there's probably way more. There really probably is way more. Um, but yeah, sometimes life can be challenging in a wheelchair and these are sort of the mental hurdles that you have to kind of get over when you are first paralyzed and it takes a while. It really does take a while. I want to leave you guys with a quote that I read the other day that I thought was really simple but really profound and the quote is by Henry David Thoreau and it says, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. And that is really something that I think is so important to sort of grasp when you have a spinal cord injury because it's not your situation that matters, it's how you deal with it. It's not what is there, it's what you see. And if you see your wheelchair and your life with a disability as an awful, horrible, bad luck, you know, terrible situation, then it's probably gonna be one of those situations. But if you see it as a beautiful, challenging, rewarding, you know, situation, then you're gonna see the great things about it. And not that life in a wheelchair is great, because there are lots of challenging things, but it's not awful either. And I think we have to have that balance of emotions in order to stay positive. So um, I'll leave you guys with that. I hope if you are experiencing challenges currently, uh, this video made you feel less alone. Um, and I hope that you will know that um, challenges don't last forever. And if you can just sort of keep a little perspective and a little gratitude, then those challenges usually seem less big and less dire than, um, than we make them out to be. So yeah, that's all I got for you guys. I will catch you back here on another video. Bye guys. I rambled so much through this video. Oh my God. If you're still here, seriously, I'm sorry for rambling through all of this video. That's what you get for not filming a video for like two whole weeks. You forget how to talk. Bye.